Now it's probably true that most people watching this sermon this morning will live in Whittlesea. So most of you will already know that Whittlesea is a fairly quiet town with a pretty low crime rate. And it's therefore not often that we see a police helicopter hovering around in the sky, but occasionally it does happen. When it happens at night and they're trying to follow someone, occasionally you'll see them switch on a very strong spotlight on the bottom of the helicopter. And when they do, you see this beam of light coming down, lighting up the ground to help them see who or what they're looking for. When it's dark and you're trying to find something, a spotlight is very useful and a police helicopter can hold a very large and very bright one. All sorts of things can hide in the dark, but that bright light exposes the problem. Well, James wants to shine a spotlight into the lives of Christians. He knows that despite someone becoming a Christian, their life still contains many sins. Yes, they've been forgiven for all past and present sins. Yes, fundamentally their heart has been changed, their new desires to please God have replaced old desires to please themselves. And yet he knows that the old sinful nature is still there lurking in those dark places. And he wants to shine a spotlight right into those areas to expose the problems so that they can be dealt with. Maybe you find it shocking for me to say that a Christian's life is still sinful. Well, that is what the Bible teaches. And I'm sure that if you're a Christian, you will know that it's true in your own life too. It's certainly true for me. I really wish that it wasn't, but I know that it is. I know that passages like the one that we're looking at in James today are talking about me. I know that they're shining a light into my life and I hope this morning into yours too as we look at it together. And you can be assured that James felt that way too about himself. The author of this letter is widely believed to be James, the brother of Jesus. And as such, he would have had a very unique experience growing up with a perfect brother. He would have seen firsthand Jesus growing up, but quite literally never doing anything wrong. And he could then compare that to his own life and to the lives of Christians that he knows and sees and see a real difference. Is it any wonder then that when he considers how Christians use their words, he cries out in verse 10 of chapter three, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. Later in his life, James became one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, where some of the apostles were based. Acts 15 suggests that James was one of the key elders in the church there, possibly even the chief elder. And then after persecution came to the church and the people were scattered all around, James wrote this letter to them to encourage them in their Christian walk, encouraging them to pay attention to how they are living, asking them, are they like Jesus? And it's important to emphasise when reading James that he is writing to Christians because over the years, many have misunderstood what he wrote, particularly the passage in chapter two that could be read as, a, as being in direct contradiction to some of Paul's writings. For example, Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter two and verse eight, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Then compare that with what James says in chapter two, and verse 24, he says, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So when making this comparison, it's easy to see where the confusion might come in. But the problem is easily solved by realizing that James and Paul are actually talking about different things. Paul is concerned with justification, how we are made right with God. Whereas James is concerned with sanctification, the process where we are made more like Jesus. Justification happens once, 
when we become a Christian and is based entirely on God's work through faith. Whereas sanctification is an ongoing process, something that will continue through our whole lives until we reach heaven. And sanctification is also something that we as Christians have a part to play. God is still key, and we would say the most important part, as he gives the motivation, the strength, the prompting, the tools, and the ability to deal with sin in our lives. But if you're a Christian, you must play your part too. Examining yourself, looking for sin, and working in partnership with God to deal with it. This is what James is concerned with. Not earning salvation, but working out how that salvation that Jesus has already earned impacts our lives. So James writes his letter to Christians and spends the bulk of the letter shining a light on the lives of his readers, encouraging them to examine themselves, encouraging us to examine ourselves, to look for sin and to deal with it encouraging us to be more like Jesus and live out this new life that we've been given. He writes in verse 22 of chapter 1, Be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. And if you scan through the pages, you will see he touches on various Subjects, our use of words, caring for the needy, being judgmental, selfishness, and various other topics. In each case, seeking to expose the sin that remains in the lives of Christians. Something he knows that every Christian will need to be working on. That is, until they finally reach heaven and are given a new body capable of perfect obedience. Well, this morning, the topic of the passage we read earlier is the tongue, or more generally, our use of words. The topic he introduces first in chapter 1 and verse 26, where he says, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Words play a very important part in our lives, and sadly, often we fail to use them as we should. I don't mean technically forming grammatical sentences, uh, but God, God doesn't really care about that. But using our words to help others rather than hinder them. Using our words to build up rather than tear other people down. James is so right to bring this area of our lives to our attention because we fail so often. But why is that? What's the root of the problem? Well, James tells us it's our still sinful heart. He points to this fact in verse 12 of our passage. He says, Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Here he gives two examples of things that cannot happen. A fruit tree only produces the fruit of its kind. A fig tree, figs, a grapevine, grapes. It can't produce anything else. In the example of a pond that contains salt water, it cannot give fresh water to drink. And so it is with our use of words. It's not possible for someone whose heart is sinful to be perfect in their use of words. So what's the key to being more godly, more Christ-like in our use of words? Well, the answer is, as we shall see, to have a more godly, more Christ-like heart. And for the rest of the time this morning, I want us to think about how we should react as Christians to the teaching that James unfolds here. Teaching where he's pointing out that maybe our hearts are not quite as Christ-like as we would like. Or maybe not quite as godly as we thought they were. And I think James would have us react in three ways. First, react in repentance. Second, react in prayer. And third, in action. So let's think about repentance. Repentance because we have very clearly disobeyed God. We need to admit we get things wrong, to admit our hearts are still sinful in this way, to say sorry to God for going so wrong and to ask 
for his forgiveness. This, I think, is what James has in mind in chapter 4 and verse 8, where he says, Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. And in chapter 4, verse 10, when he says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Now, you may well be thinking to yourself right now, well, surely, surely it's not all that bad. You know, I'm pretty good at not speaking when I shouldn't, or at not swearing, or at not using God's name as a swear word. But what's more, you know, I'm a Christian. I've already repented of my sin. I don't need to do it again. Well, if that's what you're thinking, then I'm afraid I don't think James would agree with you. Let's look at what he says. In verse 2, he indicates that the standard expected of us is perfection. He says, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. The implication here is that there is a standard that's set, which we need to meet. A standard that it's even more important that teachers in the church meet, as indicated in verse 1. Because any failure to meet that standard bears more consequences. A standard that is ultimately set by Jesus, who, as I indicated earlier, James had much experience of as his brother. Think about, for a minute, Jesus' use of words while here on this earth. He used them to comfort and to heal others. He used them to teach, to point out and correct things that were wrong. He used them to cast out demons, to draw people to himself and to guide them into a loving relationship with his father. He never used them to put others down or for his own selfish means. He never spoke out of turn, but always spoke up when it was required. He was always consistent, always loving, always kind, always truthful. And this is even more remarkable if you think not only about spoken words, but unspoken too. Think about how much we use words in general. We write them down. We use them in our minds to help us think. We use them in our emotions when we're cross about things. We even use them in our dreams. I remember someone telling me that when you learn a different language and you go and live in that country so that you're immersed in that language, one of the things that happens is that you have dreams in that new language. Now, I think that's very interesting because it really shows our dependence on words in all our lives. And when Jesus used words in all their various forms, they were always used perfectly. And think more generally still about God's usage of words. He who created the heavens and the earth by speaking. He who wrote the Bible, where we're told that every word is breathed out by God and is profitable to us. That is the standard. Which of us can get anywhere close to this? And James is very realistic, actually, about our shortcomings. In verse 2, he says, For we all stumble. In many ways. And we have to say that he's so right. Who could possibly say otherwise? Later in verse 9 he points out how inconsistent we are. He says, with it, that's our tongues, we bless our Lord and Father and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. When compared to Jesus our inconsistency is simply staggering. James says in verse 10, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. You know, in the one sentence we say great things about God, but in the next we say something bad about the people that God made. How inconsistent is that? So, faced with this example of Jesus, and faced with the reality of what we are really like, what are we to do? How should we react? Well, the answer is the only thing we can do, and that is to turn to God in repentance. Turn to God and admit how bad we are and how much we need Jesus so we can be forgiven. 
turn to God and admit how utterly dependent we are on him for forgiveness, as we certainly are not capable of dealing with this sin ourselves. And turn to God to give thanks for Jesus' perfect life and perfect obedience in dying in our place, for providing a means whereby our sin can be completely removed. So I think first James would have us as Christians react to our sin in repentance. But then I think he would also have us react in prayer. Prayer because we are so aware of the impossible task that's in front of us. Prayer because we have realised that we are what we are up against, the standard that's expected of us and how difficult it will be to achieve it. And prayer because we realise just how dependent we are on God's help to make any progress. Let's see what James says in this passage. Verses 7 and 8 say this, For every kind of beast and bird, a reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can be tamed. It can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. James is pointing out that as humankind, we've been very good at taming animals. We have pets in our houses. We have animals trained to help us do work. We have even bred many breeds of animal to improve milk or meat production, or even just to run faster. And these things have been successfully going on for thousands of years. And yet when it comes to our tongues, the things that we say, the things that we think about, no one can claim success. James says our tongues are a restless evil, full of deadly poison. It's a pretty damning assessment. But who? Who can argue? Our past success rate for succeeding here is terrible. So why would we be any different going forward? Then he shows us that success in this matter could have such a positive impact on our lives and on other people's lives. If only we could get it right. He says in verses 3 and 4, If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. Huge ships are steered by a relatively small piece of metal. Big strong horses are brought under our control by putting a bit into their mouths. The implication here is that we, we could only control what we say, what we think, how we use our words, and it will make such a difference to us and to those around us. But then he also points out also that the impact of failure is massive. He says in verses 5 and 6, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting it on fire, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. I read the other day that on average 7 million acres of land in the USA are burned by wildfires every year. And almost 90% of these are caused by accident by humans, discarded cigarettes or campfires going out of control. Small fires starting massive devastation. Well, James points out that our tongues are similar. The things we say out loud if we say the wrong words or say them in the wrong way can have massive problems, cause massive problems. The things that we choose not to say can cause just as many problems, particularly if our body language or our expression say something different. The things we say inside to ourselves and our minds can cause us to make all sorts of decisions that we regret later. You see, words are very dangerous. James wants us to know that we are playing with fire. If used well, they can bring pleasure and life and warmth, but if used badly, they can bring destruction and division and even death. This 
is what we're facing. This is what James wants us to know, the scale of this impossible task. But he also wants us to know the solution, and that is our dependence on God, best expressed in praying to him. He says in chapter 4, verse 2, you do not have because you do not ask. He says in chapter 5 and verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Or chapter 5, verse 15, and the prayer of faith will save up the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. Or verse 16 of chapter 5, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. You see what James is getting at? Prayer is effectively saying to God, I cannot do this. I need you. But if you help me, it can be done. And with God, nothing is impossible. Not even creating the heavens and the earth, not even sending his son in the likeness of the ones that he created. Remember what Jesus, that son, said to his disciples when they were struggling to know how to cast out a demon. Recorded in Matthew 17 and verse 20, he said, For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. You see, we are dependent on God, but that makes this impossible task possible, when done in his strength rather than in our own. So let's take James's advice and ask for what we do not have. Prayerfully ask him for help with our use of words. So James would have us first repent, and then second to pray, but then third to act on what we have heard. Action because God asks us to play our part in our sanctification, in that process that I mentioned at the beginning of becoming more like Jesus. James is pretty clear on his teaching on this in chapter 2. Just look at verse 14 where he says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. James says, what good is it if you say you are a Christian, you say that your sins are forgiven, you say that God has changed your heart, and yet your life shows no evidence for what you're saying? To use James's word, words, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. If you really have faith, if you really have realised all that Jesus has done for you, then that faith will result in change, in some kind of action. So let's apply this to how we use our words. How does James's call to action apply to our spoken and unspoken words? Well, I guess most of us will initially respond by thinking that James is saying that we should speak less and listen more. We certainly might think that from what James says in chapter 1 and verse 19. He says, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. It's a verse that's often quoted, and we probably remember this as meaning it is good to speak less. But it doesn't actually say that. It just says be slow to speak. Or in other words, consider or think about what you are saying. <clears throat> Speaking less is not always the answer, although sometimes it is a good idea. <clears throat> verse 1 of chapter 3 indicates that very often it is necessary to speak. What good would a silent teacher be? And we all know that sometimes it's better to, be, to, to speak than to be quiet. If someone's in need of an encouragement or comfort, doing that without words is actually very difficult. And many misunderstandings occur because not enough was said. Facial expressions or body language can be easily misunderstood, whereas words help to clarify. But while saying less, or at least being slower to speak, may be good advice, I think James has something deeper, something more fundamental in mind here. 
In verse 12, he talks about fruit. The fruit of a plant is always consistent with its type. A fig tree always produces figs. A grapevine always produces grapes. So James is saying that our lives will always be consistent with what's going on inside us, what's going on in our minds, where our heart is. James's teaching here is the same as Jesus' teaching, recorded in John chapter 15. Listen to what Jesus said, starting at verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. This is what we need to get to grips with, because Jesus is talking about our problem here. He is saying that as Christians, we are like branches of a vine joined into him as the main vine. And as such, we derive all our goodness and all our strength from him, just as a branch derives all its goodness and strength from the main vine. And as soon as that connection to the main vine is weakened or blocked, then the branch is weakened because it can no longer get the nutrients that it so depends on. Jesus says the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. But if the branch remains connected, if the flow between the main vine and the branches is good, then much fruit, fruit will be provide, produced. Jesus said, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. So what are we to do? Well, we are to ensure our connection to the vine is good and is clear of blockages so that all the goodness of Jesus can flow into our hearts. So that as we speak, the fruit of that connection will be clear because our words will be like those of Jesus. Think about a waste, paper, waste water pipe flowing from a sink or a shower in your house. If it gets blocked up by something, the water cannot empty through it. If it gets a bit clogged, then the water flows out very slowly. If it's too narrow, the water cannot flow quickly. But our connections to Jesus can suffer the same problems. That connection can become blocked with unforgiven sin. So we must deal with that sin by confessing it to God. The connection can become clogged up by neglecting that relationship. So we must spend time with Jesus. Or the connection can become too narrow by our lack of understanding. So we must spend time figure out, figuring out what God tells us about himself in the Bible. These are all things that we should be doing, all things where we should be taking action on. So our words, spoken and unspoken, are influenced by Jesus, by God, our Father, and by the Holy Spirit. And if they are influenced fully by God, they will be tamed, as, Jesus, as James instructs, but not through our efforts, but through Christ living and working in us. So James has shined a spotlight into our hearts in this chapter. He has shown us some dirty and some unpleasant things lurking there in the darkness. His letter shows us that we should repent and we should pray and we should take some action ourselves. He's taken us to a rather uncomfortable place. But I want to reassure you this morning that this is okay. In fact, it's actually a good thing because if our sanctification is to continue as it must, these problems need highlighting. And in any case, this is a good thing because it brings us straight back to Jesus, straight back to his death for us on the cross so that we can be forgiven and straight back to his word, the Bible, for encouragement. Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12 say this, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Yes, we sin, but Jesus has dealt with that sin. 
God says to any Christian who's doubting that this morning, as far as the east is from the west, so far I have removed your transgressions from you. You can go into the rest of the day, into the week, with any burden removed. In a minute, we're going to sing a song that reminds us of exactly that. The first verse of that song says this. What love could remember no wrongs that we've done? Omniscient, all-knowing, but he doesn't count their sum. Thrown out into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. What a truth that is. Our sins, yes, they are many, but God's mercy is more. Let me pray. Our Father, as we read and think on passages like this one in James, we quickly realise we have done so much that's wrong in regard to our words. So we come to you this morning in the name of Jesus and admit this and ask that you would forgive us through his death on the cross. We thank you for your promises to remove our sin and we praise you because we know that you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sin. And we stand in wonder at your mercy. Our sins, as many as they are, but your mercy is always more. Amen.